is a keynote conversation uh, led by or moderated by Candace Rondeau, who's been a part of the Future Security Initiative for many years. She's Senior Director of Future Frontlines and Planetary Politics here at New America, and she's a professor of practice in the Future Security Initiative at Arizona State University. She'll be speaking with Ambassador Oksana Markova of Ukraine. Thank you. Um, well, Ambassador, thank you, and, and, and welcome to, to New America. This is your first time. Yes, uh, first exciting. time here physically. That's right. Uh, virtually, we've had many moments, but also you and I have had a few moments here and there, so I'm excited for this conversation. Um, I wanted to introduce you, if you don't mind, to, uh, to our audience uh, here uh, at, at New America and online. Uh, for those of you who don't know her, um, I would say that over the last two years, uh, two and a half years really, since her appointment as Ukraine's uh, ambassador to the United States, uh, Oksana Makarova has been one of the most active and energetic diplomats on the circuit in Washington, D.C. And I really count myself as very lucky uh, to have been able to sat across the table from you uh, on many occasions to talk about um, the future of Ukraine, um, how to respond to this uh, war of aggression that Russia is, is waging against your country. Um, I've met a lot of diplomats uh, in, my, in, my, in my time. Um, and I have to say, very few have impressed me as much as you uh, in large part because, you know, not only do you work tirelessly for Ukraine's interests, but you really are working in one of the toughest towns in the world to be a diplomat. Um, I don't envy anybody uh, coming into Washington uh, for the first time trying to figure out how it works, because uh, we all struggle. <laughs> uh, those of us who live here struggle with it. Um, but you, you have really mastered the arcane art of uh, navigating the State Department, the Pentagon, uh, the White House. I have seen you throw out a first pitch at the National <laughs> Stadium, and now you've got a pretty good arm, I'd say, actually. <laughs> pretty impressive. Um, I was trying not to embarrass my son. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did well. You did well. <laughs> uh, but prior to your time here, uh, you were also uh, at the Ministry of Finance uh, from 2015 to 2020, uh, first Deputy Minister and Government uh, Commissioner on Investments, and then uh, since 2018 as Minister of Finance. Uh, you know about money, apparently. Uh, and you have degrees in environmental science from the uh, Kyiv Mohila Academy in Ukraine, uh, an, MFA, uh, an MPA, sorry, in uh, public finance uh, from Indiana University, corn huskers, let's go. Um, and you also have a head for numbers. Uh, I have seen that also at work in some of our conversations, uh, and science. And I think you know a lot about what it takes to run a business, uh, having spent 17 years uh, in the private equ equity field. Um, so you, I think you also have a sense of what's going to happen next in terms of reconstruction, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. So um, again, thank you for coming. Uh, thanks for making the time. Uh, our time is unfortunately limited. I'd love to stay up here all day. Um, but I want to start out with, um, I think, one of the big challenges that's probably on everybody's mind here. Um, you know, Ukraine is fighting a war. The defense uh, alone must cost who knows how many billions, right? Um, but we also know that there is just a huge reconstruction need, uh, ongoing and in the future. Uh, and I think one of the biggest questions most recently has been around uh, the need for reconstruction in the area of, of grain exports uh, and production um, and, and where we're going to go next with that. So I'd, one, I'd like to just ask you sort of, what is your impression of you know, what happened with um, uh, the Black Sea, uh, Black sea uh, Grain Initiative in terms of its impact uh, on Ukraine's export capacity? Um, and so what's Ukraine's perspective on you know, how to kind of bring that back together or um, you know, move forward? Thank you, thank you, Candice, and thank you for having me. It's, it's, it's a great pleasure to be here and to be able to have this discussion. And uh, uh, thank you for keeping on the agenda, something that is not only important for us in Ukraine, but actually has a global meaning. And the result of this war, and you know, hopefully uh, the, the, the victory of Ukraine soon in this war is going to be a prerequisite of all of us, all countries that have the same values, but also countries that want to deliver better to their citizens uh, to restore as soon as possible the supply chains, to, to address the food security needs, energy security needs. And I think food security and in general the agricultural uh, issues that you just uh, mentioned are key issues. First, they're key issues for Ukraine. Ukraine has been a very heavily 
uh, agricultural country. And when I say agricultural, it's not just growing, but it's food processing, it's, it's all the value chain. We own 30% of the global black uh, soil, you know, the best type of soil for the, for, for, for the growth. And actually the productivity gain that could happen in that field is huge. This is something that before the full-fledged war started, we wanted to develop as one of the key advantages of Ukraine. We are top five exporters of the majority of crops from wheat to barley. We're number one, used to be number one in sunflower oil. We are very high on honey. Uh, so we can, we can feed the world. And once called the breadbasket of, of Europe, we can definitely be a global breadbasket. Now, Russia specifically, in addition to the aggressive war, in addition to their war crimes, uh, horrific war crimes against civilians, women, children, in addition to just, you know, having this unjust war, they specifically target the food. So they destroy the grain storages, they destroy the port facilities, they block the Black Sea. The only reason Ukraine is not able to deliver the food which we grow for so many regions, especially for Middle East and Asia, especially for African countries, uh, we cannot do it simply because of the Russian actions. Now, with the help of UN and Turkey, for, uh, for some time, they were able to broker this uh, grain initiative, which uh, Russia agreed, but then sabotaged, of course, every month. You know, they were trying to delay the ship inspections. They were trying to, to scare the, sh the, the ship uh, companies, you know. So it wasn't going perfect even when it was there. But Ukraine always stick to what we wanted to do, you know, to get the grain, to get everything out so that we can, and in addition to just selling it, we even donated, you know, we have this program called Grain from Ukraine, where we donated grain and other countries, U.S. through the USAID actually helped to pay for the shipments so that we can donate it to countries in need. So right now we are in a situation when Russia decided to stop it and block it. They're trying to create or put out all kinds of unreasonable additional demands. We are ready to continue, of course, but it looks like, uh, you know, Russians really would like to weaponize the food again. Now, we are trying to export as much as we can through the land borders using other ports. That's why you see during the past uh, weeks increased attacks on Odessa, Odessa region, closer to the Romanian border, that's they're trying to prevent any type of shipment of the food, which will affect not only the shipment of what we have in the storages, but also the harvesting, because we are in the process of harvesting, which is, I think, remarkable that Ukrainian farmers uh, have been able to plant, care, and harvest now uh, the, the products uh, in the situation when they are not only under constant attacks, but we are also one of the most mined countries now. The unexploded ordinance, not only in the residential areas or mines, but also in the, in the field. So, uh, look, you know, we will do whatever we can. Soon there will be again another General Assembly of the United Nations. This issue is going to be discussed, of course, and raised by Ukraine. We are trying to communicate with all of our friends and allies, especially in, you know, what people call the Global South you know, essentially saying we have to be very vocal, we have to press on Russia, we have to tell them that we know who is behind this, and uh, they have to stop not only this aggressive war against Ukraine, but they have to stop threatening half of the globe with, with the food crisis, because it's serious. Yeah, it is extremely serious. I mean, as you were talking, I was reflecting on um, a long ago visit to uh, the Museum of the History of the Holodomor, mm. uh, which is a remarkable um, place in, in Kiev. Uh, very striking if you've never been there. I will just tell you it, it lies uh, kind of on this open uh, sort of uh, square where there are tremendous monuments and, and historical uh, museums uh, of great value. But the Holodomor Museum to me is interesting just in the context of food security, the weaponization of food, uh, this constant refrain of, of Russia to return again and again uh, to the food as the weapon uh, mm -hmm. historically is, is um, well, it's, it's tragic, uh, but also uh, I think it should be a lesson to us all that actually uh, as the, you know, the conflict continues, uh, we should just expect that to continue on some level uh, from Russia. 
Um, so there are some, you know, there are some challenges ahead, as you say. Uh, I know that other people are going to also have questions about um, just kind of the humanitarian crisis, because of mm -hmm. course this relates uh, not just to food security, but human security. And um, I, again, just want to remark on how st struck I was. Many war zones, you name them, with the exception of Iraq, I think I've been to all of them. Uh, <laughs> and so I, I'm just curious to sort of, for me, it was interesting to see how well the civilian response um, was sort of coordinated. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the humanitarian situation now, mm -hmm. um, what you might predict for the future, the winters coming up. Um, what's, what's needed? What's, uh, what are the challenges that you see? Well, yes, and the, you, you, you noted the Museum of Holodomor, which is you know, striking that this year is the 90 years mark of that tragedy when Russians denied food, took all the food, and people were dying from hunger. And this is, this is probably the most cruel, uh, you know, this and children, when you live in the country where literally food grows everywhere. And, and, and to create artificial hunger in the place which was the source of food for so many neighbors, not only for, for itself, is a very cynical and very cruel, uh, you know, war crime, but again, not surprising what we see now, because unfortunately we have a history of war crimes of Russians, whether it's Russian Federation, Soviet Union, or Russian Empire against Ukrainians. But with regard to the humanitarian situation, on the one hand, it's a very unique, I would say, war, because I don't think we will find many wars when the government continued to execute its functions and never stopped it, not even for a day. So yes, where it was under occupation, even there, our mayors tried to execute their functions and be with people and try to deliver food and organize something. That's why so many of our mayors have been kidnapped by, by Russians, tortured or even killed, mm -hmm. uh, especially in the areas which they occupied and which they stay occupied. But in general, all the areas where we have the control and as soon as we liberate, there is Ukrainian government there, both national and local. And all the society, and that's another key element, you know, this, the civil society that work together with the government. So we are trying to address all these challenges with the help that we are receiving from the U.S. But that's why, you know, for the first time, actually, in our 32 years history, U.S. is providing us with the budget, direct budget support, hmm. the grand direct budget support. And this money are actually humanitarian money. They used to pay the salaries to to uh, educators, they used to support the IDPs, they used to, to provide the basic needs for people, and it's done by the active government. Our banking system never stopped working during the war. During this war, Ukrainians, especially when there was, the Russians were advancing at the beginning and occupying, people were actually putting money on their accounts yeah. and throwing their cards and trying to move to the territory which Ukraine controls because they knew that that's how it, it will be kept safe. Our digital system, you know, DIA, uh, which we have on our phones, so we don't, you don't need to have passport or driver license with you. You have it all in your phone. And that also allows us to communicate directly and to send money directly to people through this app, essentially governmental app. And we have more than 20 million Ukrainians that are communicating with the government like that. So this is unique that we are trying to use the digitalization, the, the innovations, and the government is adapting to this situation. On the other hand, of course, it's a humanitarian crisis of massive proportions. So yes, we're able to do and to use the help that we are receiving from the US and other partners to, to utilize it. But then any thing you look, not all of our schools have bomb shelters. Not all of them had, and we need that in order for kids to continue their education. The majority of our kids are behind in their vaccination schedules, of course. Uh, the majority uh, of people with a very like rare or the diseases that require daily care, you know, the, the different type of cancers, the people who require, uh, who are on the uh, different type of daily supports like uh, dialysis or something like this. They cannot get it, and uh, not only under occupation. Uh, under occupation, it's, it's a total disaster. That's why people are killed and, and tortured and not have the access to basic needs. But even in the places where 
uh, you know, either close to the front lines or everywhere. The need is pretty much in every sector, whether it's healthcare or education or transportation. And plus, not to mention, every day Russia is trying to shell the infrastructure. Russia is trying to attack civilian objects, but also others. Uh, there are more people that are killed or wounded. We have uh, an extreme number of people who lost their limbs, and it's not only the, our brave warriors, but it's also civilians throughout. And of course, preparing now for the winter, we remember what happened last winter, when Russians specifically targeted the energy system in order to create the blackouts and to create the situation when either there will be additional waves of uh, refugees because you cannot stay on them. And unfortunately, Ukraine has cold winters. And uh, when you don't have the electricity or energy supply, it's not just about cold. You don't have the, the water supply. You don't have sewage. You don't have any other basic needs. And that's, that's a very, very uh, difficult situation. However, and I just came back from Kyiv five days ago. I was there when Secretary Blinken visited. The resolve of Ukrainian people is still there. I've seen it when I came back after Bucha was just liberated. It was April 2022. I've seen it in September when I was there. I've seen it in December 22. It was cold and dark. And, and I've seen it now, and it's, it's been throughout the 17 months that people say it's difficult, uh, it's, it's horrible, it's uh, many losses, but nobody uh, would say, uh, you know, that we shall surrender. We all know that, you know, surrendering for us, it just means that we will all die, and fighting is at least we have a chance to survive. And, you know, this resolve to fight is still there. Resolve to do everything possible and sometimes impossible. Yeah. Yeah, that resolve certainly comes through. And I, I actually was going to ask you a little bit about, uh, just as a small follow-up, uh, on the work being done, I think, with the help of the U.S. and maybe some others on kind of building more resilient infrastructure mm -hmm. for uh, electricity in particular. If you could talk a little bit about yes. that. Um, yes. Uh, we actually are working very actively with the State Department and Department of Energy. And USAID is, the, of course, part of this group. So we have, like we have Rammstein meetings on weapons. We have literally weekly meetings on energy coordination. And what we're trying to do, and that comes a little bit related also to the reconstruction post-war, yeah. uh, is, uh, and to steal your president's uh, quote, build back better. So when we are looking at what Russians are destroying, we're trying not just to rebuild or repair what, what was there, but already think, where shall we be in 10 years? So during this 17 months of war, as surprising as it is, uh, our cabinet of ministers adopted the energy strategy for the next 10 years. We agreed how we will replace the coal mines and everything else which have been destroyed with the renewables and we will change our mix and we will continue developing our nuclear stations, which is the base for Ukraine. So we, a little bit more than 50% of in our mix comes from the nuclear and Ukrainians are very, um, you know, uh, professional in, in, in the nuclear energy field. And when we are talking to all of our friends and trying to get this additional transformers and, and generators and everything else, of course, I mean, it's not something that is on the shelf and you can pick whatever you want. It's, it's something that you, it's, it's rare commodity even without the war. But when we're choosing between different options, we already are thinking, is it in line with this 10 year strategy? Mm -hmm. Is it in line with our post-war reconstruction visit, vision? Because we, can, we want after we win and there will be big need to rebuild and the, the, the destruction is uh, really big, especially in the areas which has been occupied for a longer time. We want to do it in a way that we can leapfrog from where we have been in 2022 ahead already. So in all the sectors which are critical for Ukraine, like agriculture, energy, uh, IT and digital, to do something that is 22nd century, you know, you know, to do something that we can get more business to come to invest. Because, you know, let's, let's face it, uh, just the recent study of the World Bank, and they're doing this rapid uh, damage, uh, uh, rapid damage uh, report. So it's called our DNA. So the 
damage, just the physical damage, not, not the losses of the profits, not just the physical damage of what they have assessed was destroyed by Russians uh, during the first full calendar of the full-fledged war as of February 2023, mm -hmm. uh, amounted to 411 billion US dollars. It's, it's actually, it's not taken into account a big environmental damage. It's not taken into account into the mining that has to be demined. It's not taken, it's not yet, it, it doesn't include the destruction of the dam, mm. which actually is not just a simple environmental catastrophe and, and the losses that were right there for the water that was rushed uh, down south. But that reservoir was the source of the water mm. for the agricultural district and for many uh, towns and cities. So the overall long-term effects are going to be also big. So, you know, the damage is huge. And in order to repair, we, of course, would welcome any help from our friends and allies. But the question whether we will be able to leapfrog and do it is going to depend on will we attract business, right. compliant, large business that will come and, and will do it together with us. Yeah. And, and that's why we have to open the door for all these innovations and do it in a very inspiring way so that we can become a hub for these innovations in our part of the world. So interesting. I mean, that's one of the paradoxes of war, isn't it? That, I mean, that um, it forces so much loss, but then mm. after the fact, oftentimes there is a leapfrog uh, in all kinds of ways, sometimes social, sometimes uh, you know, technological, uh, industrial. Um, but you, you, you mentioned something, actually, that uh, you touched on Ramstein. Uh, mm. Which maybe people in the room don't really know what that is, uh, but if you uh, if you've spent any time in Germany, you will know that there is a base called Ramstein. Uh, it used to be an expo for for a lot of folks coming out of Afghanistan. Uh, probably still is for most of the Middle East, and uh, a very important uh, tie up, lash up for uh, the collaboration and coordination of weapons transfers to Ukraine's uh, frontline fighters. Um, we know that there's been a big decision uh, recently uh, on the sort of big list of items that you were looking for in Ukraine. Uh, we're getting close to two, in fact. One, we have the F-16s. Are you talking about this one? Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> when did you pin that on? Uh, before the decision. Yeah, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> it was like a magic talisman. So, uh, Denmark. Uh, yes. I believe, uh, has come Netherlands. through. Netherlands has come through. Um, what do you think, I mean, what are you hearing from your colleagues uh, in, in the defense side about the impact of the F-16s? Uh, what will it take to kind of get everything up and running? Uh, what do you predict uh, will happen in the next year? What, we, what we should, should we look for? Well, first of all, you know, as you know, we have been since February 24th working on the very long list of capabilities. Unfortunately, we are fighting with not only brutal and criminal enemy, but also enemy that is much larger than us. So with all the support that we are getting, Russia is still, you know, people-wise, and the methods they use to conscribe, you know, they can pretty much force uh, any amount of people, whoever they can catch and whoever uh, did not leave the country uh, to, to, to send them on the front line. But also they have a lot of weapons. <clears throat> yes, bad Soviet type, you know, sometimes not working, but the quantity sometimes is a quality in itself. Yes. So um, the, the list was large, and first we were using both our old Soviet type of equipment and some Ukrainian equipment, and then started Hi. getting the javelins and stingers and then everything else, and now we are almost 100% uh, using the NATO st standard equipment. And to get more capabilities, is very important because, you know, as military people say, you know, it's on the one hand, it's a very World War I type of war, you know, like it's, a, it's an artillery duels on a very long period, very mined, you know, Russians simply are destroying whole villages, you know, the city of Marienka, the city of Bakhmut. Unfortunately, when they were advancing, they did not think about even the civilians. I mean, they were just destroying inch by inch by inch moving forward. And... Um, you know, so we need to counter that. We need to fight with that, but we also need to do something with their uh, supremacy in the air, which is also very important. So uh, we were discussing a number of capabilities from the beginning, and we are very glad that now we have the political decision on the F-16, 
because it's a very important part of the air defense. It's a very important part of the, like it's, 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 it's an additional capability that has so many, uh, so, so much use. And as you know, our pilots are already uh, at the training and we're working with our friends and partners and big thanks to Netherlands and Denmark for agreeing to transfer the platforms and we're working on that. So again, it's, it's, a, it's a very complex capability. So it will take, you know, some effort to completely get it. But, you know, it's, it's you know, all capabilities that we were getting were for the battlefield today, throughout the 17 months, but we always were thinking also about the building the army of the future, mm. how the Ukrainian military will look like after this. Because again, with our aspirations as the future member of the European Union and future member of NATO, we do have now the largest, the most capable, the battle-tested army, which will be an asset for the future transatlantic family. So for us, any capabilities that we add now, it's not just the equipment that our brave defenders can use now, but it's also, it's also shaping through the battle the future force of Ukraine, which again inevitably will be the eastern flank of, of NATO. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a very, we already have shown and our brave defenders have shown how quickly they can learn. Uh, the US Patriots, I think, are showing remarkable performance saving lives, saving children in Ukraine, but also showing how superior they are to any of the equipment that Russia has. So it's not only a great capability for us to have, and we're very grateful to the US for that, but it's also a signal to so many other countries that whoever relied upon Russia to provide them uh, the military uh, support or the SAGs, you know, from the Wagner Group, uh, they can no longer do either of them. That's right. And it's, it's, it's a wake-up call that, you know, with the size of economy that they have, with the lack of values and aggressive nature and imperialistic thinking, which is totally outdated in the 21st century, but they cannot even do the evil things as they did. I mean, they're still doing them to us. But uh, so, so it's, a, it's a big, I think, geopolitical question for a number of our friends in, in, in the rest of the world. And UN is such a great place to, to talk about it and discuss it and see that we have to reform too. We have to move forward. We have to address the problem with the country that doesn't respect the UN Charter. Mm. Yeah, I mean, those conversations at the UNGA coming up, I think mm -hmm. uh, to be a fly on the wall there would be quite something. I, I have to say, uh, and I'm glad that you mentioned our friends, uh, the Wagner Group. Uh, as you know, I've spent a lot of time uh, thinking about those guys, way too much time, and so is my colleague Ben Dalton, uh, who is in the audience with us today, my partner in crime. A lot of folks in here actually have been very much uh, part of the conversation about the Wagner Group, uh, not only in New America, but uh, certainly I think in the United States uh, and other places where people are paying attention. So we've had some big action uh, pretty recently. I was planning to come to Kyiv, actually, uh, but a certain friend of ours got in the way. Um, Yevgeny Prigozhin uh, and Dmitry Utkin, the, the operational commander uh, of the Wagner Group, and of course, uh, Valery Chikalov, uh, who was kind of the money, money guy, um, all killed, uh, yes. along with four bodyguards uh, and apparently a set of innocent crew members, as far as we know, we don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of questions about what happened there, read my book, whenever it comes out, you'll know. <laughs> I, I may have some thoughts on it, but I, I will say the question that I get asked now continually and I would like to ask you is, okay, they're dead, um, but the Wagner Group, we all know, has been linked to a number of war crimes, mm -hmm. uh, countless really, actually, in the Ukraine context, and we can't really we can talk about Syria and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, so what's next with kind of accountability for uh, Wagner operatives uh, what do you think is, uh, has changed, and then where are we going with accountability and justice where they're concerned? Uh, there is no last and lasting and just peace without justice. And as you know, President Zelensky, when he says, uh, talks about the peace formula, justice is such an important element of that. So uh, there we will 
do, we will not leave any stone unturned. Uh, so I will come back to Wagner, but in general, uh, we are doing the criminal investigation in Ukraine. The prosecutor general is doing a remarkable job. We have more than 100,000 individual cases that already are opened at, by the Ukrainian legislation. U.S. is helping us a lot, and by the way, Netherlands, on uh, um, uh, data collection and evidence collection and also how to talk to victims because a number of these crimes are the sexual crimes or the brutal executions of civilians or tortures, and you have to do it also in a way not to re-traumatize the, the victims. So um, we are doing this, and we are not only investigating, we are also already in the courts, and some people are not only indicted, and some people are indicted in absentia, and some people who we caught, you know, the prisoners in Ukraine, but they are also sentenced. And believe it or not, and it's, it's a big challenge, which our prosecutor's office is paying very big attention to, is that the due process of law is there, and that all Russian perpetrators actually get lawyers to represent them and to defend them, and this is the most difficult issue, to find enough uh, attorneys, Ukrainians, who would uh, defend, but we have to do it, you know, th this is what differentiates us from Russians as well. In addition to that, a dozen of countries already opened their own criminal investigations. We are fully cooperating, providing evidence to them, and uh, as many countries uh, that would do it, we are very grateful. There are three international courts, all of which have cases, whether on genocide or other. One of them already indicted, the ICC, both Putin and Lvova Belova, and rightfully so, for the kidnapping of our uh, Ukrainian children, which is, you know, part of the genocide. We are working very heavy, actively on the crime of aggression, which is the mother of, the, of all the crimes, you know, and it's a very well-documented crime, because Putin did all of that online, literally. He was publicly documenting every decision that he took, which led to announcement of this uh, special military operation, i.e. war, uh, and then he acknowledged the same actions in 2014 and 15, uh, after he stopped pretending that it was some green man in Crimea, you know, and then he said, yeah, yeah, of course it was us. So, um, so this is very important, and frankly, I mean, of course, the prosecution in Ukraine goes faster, the international courts will take some time, the crime, the tribunal for aggression will take probably even more time, but it doesn't matter. People need to know that, you know, each of this crime will be in the court of law and that there will be accountability. Now, coming back to those who are dead. Yes, you know, the leadership of the Wagner Group is uh, brutally executed in a very public way on the two months anniversary of their uh, walk uh, to, to Moscow. Uh, but, you know, uh, they were not the only ones who were committing the crimes. Uh, the thousands of Wagner operatives uh, which, uh, again, very documented, very well documented. Uh, in Ukraine, we have uh, a very big base of the evidence, uh, but all Russian troops as well. So it's not just some rogue units. It's not just some this private type of military uh, units, which, again, we know they're not really private. It's the Russian army and the Russian armed forces and the Russian president who created them and who were providing them with weapons, and who were giving them instructions. And yes, there were some disagreements between Prigozhin and Shoigu, but it's more a quarrel between, you know, the different lines of the same kind of organized crime organization, mm -hmm. rather than, you know, really state and the private um, doing it separately. So um, we'll continue investigating, we'll continue indicting them. There are other private groups not as successful, though I don't know whether successful is the word to use, of course, uh, but not as capable, but there was attempts by Russians to create these groups, and there are a number of them, That's right. we just didn't hear. They still are operating outside of uh, Russia. I mean, hopefully without a, a capable, although evil and criminal head like Prigozhin, we will see decline of the use of the SAGS mm -hmm. in, in African countries and others. Uh, but if not, then justice for everything they've done in Ukraine will also help us to get them out from so many uh, criminal missions that they have throughout the, throughout the globe. So, you know, I, I think it's a very important issue. And to get justice, 
regardless of how much time it will take, is as important as winning this war. Because that justice, wherever it will be served fully, will be the final victory in this war, together with the reconstruction. No justice, no peace. Absolutely. Right? That's how it goes. Well, we're getting kind of close to time, and I know that there's probably a question or two um, in the audience, so I want to open up the floor uh, and, and maybe get back to the question on um, the ICC and uh, the question with the children and mm -hmm. what's going on there. But let me um, go to the audience first. We'll go with uh, my colleague, Peter Bergen. So thank you. Um, you know, Candice mentioned uh, you know, all the amazing work you're doing in Washington. Um, a, a potential problem, of course, is the presidential election of 2024. Quite a number of the Republican candidates are sort of saying that they, uh, implying that they would reduce or maybe even end aid to Ukraine. I think 71% of Republicans now say uh, aid to Ukraine should stop. So how do you deal with this sort of American political scene where the Putin is surely looking at these polls and making his own conclusions. Well, first, elections are very important for any, in any democracy. And this is something for what we are fighting in Ukraine, for democracy, for the ability to choose our government and to change it on a regular basis. And uh, I would never call a, an election a problem, to be honest. This is what uh, people should do, and this is the basis of all of us continue developing, whether we like the results or not, right? Uh, so, um, first of all, I, I have big trust in American people, uh, regardless of party affiliations. When we explain it to people, uh, I always feel the support. So when we tell people why, and we tell people the more information about what's going on, and we tell people that we are fighting for our homes, for our loved ones, that we were attacked by a brutal bully with no pretext, with no reason whatsoever, that it's very much our own war for independence and freedom, I think the majority of Americans understand and feel it. Because this is what Americans have in them. This is what this country is built on, these values. So when people uh, either do not support it or say, say that you know, it's not in the American interests, it just means that we didn't explain it well. We have to do more. We have to go and talk to people. We have to give them more information. We have to provide them with this, with this uh, knowledge. And that's why, and again, I always thank the journalists, because their work has been a game changer during this phase of the, of the war. In 2014, exactly this happened. Russia attacked us exactly the same way. The Shem referendum in Crimea was no different from the Shem referendums now. But our voice was not heard. This time, it wasn't just our voice. It's the cameras and the journalists who have been there, who have been showing the world what's going on. So it's very important to continue to inform people. By informing people, we also have to tell them more about how the American help to us work. That yes, there is 113 billion that Congress very uh, generously appropriated to provide for the Ukraine and related to Ukraine support. But not all of that money goes to Ukraine. Uh, so yes, we are getting the direct budget support, which is about slightly above 10, 20 billion, for which we are very grateful. Of course, again, I, I always say how grateful we are. Uh, so that is the money we are getting in order to be able to continue the fight and sustain, sustain the effort. All the defense uh, assistance, which is much larger than this, we are not getting the money, we are getting the goods. And a number of uh, resources that Congress provided goes to replenish the uh, stocks of the Pentagon. It goes to increase the production here. I just uh, recently, last month, visited the Lima, Ohio plant, which pro produces Abramses. And I have to tell you, you know, it's, it's additional jobs there. And uh, the majority of people in that plant, I mean, I felt like I'm visiting friends there because they are proud that they are producing this excellent American capability and that we will be able to do it, similar with the plants that produces Bradley's. And then you see the videos how when our brave defenders liberated Robotene in the south and there were still people there, civilians, you know, of the age of my mother, and they were put into this American Bradley to be evacuated to safety because everyone in Ukraine, all defenders know, 
If there is a shelling, you go inside the Bradley, not outside, because this is the place where you will be kept safe. So we just have to explain that it's, you know, we're very grateful again for the weapons, but they're produced here and we're doing it together and they are developing, providing jobs here in the United States. And, and, and it's also for, for, the, for the benefit of both of our countries. You know, we need the goods in order to defend our families, but you're producing them here. And third, which is also very important, you know, we are defending not only us, we are defending the whole European uh, part, which Putin has been very loud and clear that he wants to attack and he wants to, uh, he has problems not only with Ukraine, he has problems with everyone who was able to, to get out from this empire, uh, the Russian, the Soviet, or whatever you call it. So he threatens sometimes Poland, he threatens definitely all Baltic states, he was t t t talking how the Finland and Denmark are no friends, uh, and stuff like that. So, um, you know, right now we are defending other, including NATO countries, uh, at a very modest, I would say, military budget. Just, and, and we are doing it ourselves. We are not requesting any of our friends to fight for us. It's, we don't need other boots on the ground. We just need the weapons. But if, God forbid, we fall and uh, Putin occupies completely Ukraine and, and kills us all, he will not be stopped. He will be emboldened by this. And he will inevitably go further. And then, unfortunately, a number of NATO countries will have to help to defend other NATO countries. So the, the fastest and the most um, efficient from the financial standpoint, this is the Minister of Finance and me talking, <laughs> is actually to help Ukraine more to stop the war now while it's still in Ukraine. So whether it's the moral argument, whether it's the shared values, whether it's the effectiveness and efficiency argument, because it is in the US national security interests to defeat an aggressive uh, autocratic regime that not only attacked Ukraine, let's keep in mind that they have attacked Georgia in 2008, that they have co committed horrible crimes in uh, Syria, that they have poisoned people in the streets of the United Kingdom, that they have interfered and sent their Wagner sags into so many other places, uh, not to mention all the crimes that they have committed while they were in the form of the Soviet Union. So many wars and so many. So it's, it's in all of our civilized people interests to live in a safer world, which will return to the security architecture that we had after the World War II, because that peace, and again, I do not imply that the peace was everywhere, but at least the lack of a great war, which would involve European uh, continent, has been a basis for the prosperity that we all enjoyed in the collective Western countries and in some newly, newly developed uh, economies. And we have to get back there as soon as possible if we want to continue delivering to our people, to our citizens. So I think, you know, when we explain it clearly to the American people, they understand and they support. So it's a task for all of us to explain it better. So I see, I keep getting these high signs over here. I wish we could just keep going on. I, I really, I hope you come back, first of all. Let me just say that uh, because this has been a wonderful conversation. I was going to ask you how many states you've been to, but maybe that's, we'll have that bet later. How many states have you been to, actually? Well, not, not, not too many because I'm trying to stay here. This is, this is where uh, the war is. <laughs> and, and I'm trying to travel yeah. for sure. But I've, I've been to California. I've been to Ohio. I've been to, um, uh, where did I go? Did I go? Uh, Massachusetts. I've been to Pennsylvania. I've been to Florida. And uh, New York, of course. Okay. But that's not. We're, I still. We're going to Illinois. We're I still <laughs> have to come back to Indiana. So. Okay, that's right. You got to get back to Indiana. Um, well, listen. I want to ask one tiny question, but it's going to have to be a short answer, I'm afraid. Um, I, I did want to come back to this question on the ICC decision uh, to charge Putin, uh, uh, to charge the the High Commissioner on uh, on Children's Affairs. Uh, big decision, and obviously seems to have constrained Putin's movements. Uh, what's your response, um, and, and how uh, has that decision affected uh, the, the efforts to repatriate uh, Ukrainian children from Russia? 
Well, first of all, we are very grateful to ICC for taking that case, for moving ahead with that case. This is probably, maybe for me as mother, is the most horrendous crime of all. So uh, 19, more than 19,000 cases registered already in Ukraine. The children we know have been abducted to Russia. According to the estimates of our commissioner on, on these issues, it's actually 200 or 300,000. Uh, the Russians themselves themselves claim it's even larger amount of children they rescued, as they say. But, you know, killing of Ukrainian children, abducting them to Russia, putting them into this one-day adoption, and they change their own laws to be able to put them for the speedy adoptions, indoctrinating them, putting them through what they are telling us, the teenagers that we were able to get back through the re-education camps, which sounds like a, from the book about the... Uh, World War II and, and, and what Nazis did to, to children is horrible. Yeah. It's, and everyone has to be punished for that. And the fact that ICC ruled and indicted them is, is such a notion of justice and understanding of this problem. So we are grateful for the U.S. government that is working with us on this issue. We are trying to get back as, as, as many people, children as possible. Very difficult. Unfortunately, we were able to return a very small number of them. Uh, we are very grateful to everyone in Congress. You know, there is a number of resolutions that uh, submitted on this issue, not only condemning, but also calling for some actions with regard to how to do it. It's a very difficult issue. Of course, we need to win. When we win, we will know, first of all, for sure, what is the situation on the occupied territories, but also this is when we will start, uh, you know, working more actively. I mean, we are, we are working as active as we can, but to have the win, this, of course, is going to be a big part of, uh, you know, our victory is to get all our children back. What our first lady, our president, and everyone in Ukraine says always, we will not uh, rest until every child is back. Mm. Well, let's hope that happens. Thank you again, Ambassador, for joining us. Uh, such a pleasure and an honor. Thank uh, you. And uh, I hope the audience will give you also uh, a warm applause. Thank you.